the topic of our conversation today is on innovative fund models. Um, and I'm joined today by three experts um, who I hope you hear a lot more from than you do from me. So I wanted to just tee up our conversation a little bit and then let these three have the stage. Um, just wanted to thank you all again for being here. Thanks to SoCap for hosting us. Thanks to Michelle, who's been a fantastic point of contact for us and helping to organize this panel. Um, we had an amazing last minute substitution with a sick panelist, uh, and you're all blessed uh, to be with another incredible panelist on our stage today. So um, some incredible adaptability from the SoCap team. It's been great to work with you all. Um, I wanted to um, do another show of hands uh, question for the audience really quick before we get started. Who here has ever made or received an investment or some sort of capital transaction that was neither debt nor equity? Something kind of funky in the gray areas. Hope you guys raise your hands, Tessa and Justin. Um, <laughs> cool, okay, so that looks like maybe a quarter of the room. Um, so there's some folks here with a little bit of experience with what we're talking about today, uh, and hopefully a lot of folks with just some great genuine curiosity. Um, our goal as panelists and in, in, in bringing this, this to you all today uh, is to sort of just demystify some of these examples of non-traditional capital products for entrepreneurs. I hope you leave this session today with some of your questions answered and hopefully a lot more curiosity about this subject than maybe you began with. Um, and frankly, I hope you leave today knowing three great examples of interesting, innovative fund managers who you can go to to ask specific questions about their models uh, and how they came to the conclusions that they have. So um, if you don't leave with having those accomplished today, then I am to blame. And you can personally find me afterward. Um, I want to start by asking each of our panelists um, to very briefly introduce themselves. Um, and so the basics of, of how I hope these folks can introduce themselves, hold on, it's between my two pages, um, follows this theme. Who you are, where you're based and where you work, what your fund is and what it's called, and how you invest in businesses. So this is you know, relatively straightforward, a few minutes each. Could you all go down the line and give us kind of like the who, where, what, and how of who you are and what you do? Yes, I can start. So hi, everybody. My name is Tessa Flippin, and I'm the founder and managing partner of Capitalize VC. Um, I am based in Chicago, and that's where the fund is based. And we invest in diverse founders at the intersection of e-commerce infrastructure and enablement and CPG brand. Um, and so we look to invest in, in founders both using equity, traditional VC structures, but then also a redeemable equity or what I like to call a revenue-based investment vehicle. Hi, hi everyone. I'm Justin Schwartz, managing partner of Impacto Capital. Uh, Impacto Capital is a fund based in Ecuador. Uh, we invest in the Andean region of South America. Uh, in startups, uh, in social environmental impact startups uh, using revenue-based financing. Hello, hello. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Dion Cook, uh, co-founder and CEO of Dentrum Co-op based in Seattle, Washington. Um, what was the... The what? Oh, yeah. So our fund creates safe pathways for black entrepreneurship and innovation. And we, we really uh, invest in, uh, we look to invest and create a thriving black business community to serve as an uh, anchor for economic mobility in the community. Yep. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, I hope that you all in the audience can see already here we have sort of an example of a continuum of capital products, like we typically call them, um, that serve a broad continuum of entrepreneurs. And that's sort of one of the themes that I hope you pick up on from this conversation is that when you step away from sort of this false dichotomy of debt and equity being the only sort of capital products for entrepreneurs, you can see that there's a kind of a broad spectrum of capital that can serve a broad spectrum of entrepreneurs' capital needs. And you'll, see, you'll hear examples of that from these three panelists today. Um, so broadly, these are the things that um, we'll talk about with our three panelists today. And these are the sort of areas that I think it'd be great for you all to chime in with questions about. We really want to hear from the audience because I know this issue is uh, these issues in general are um, complicated and nuanced and your questions 
no such thing as a bad question, especially in this context, so your questions are very welcome. Um, the broad themes we're gonna talk about are how these folks have designed their funds and their general strategy for their funds, um, what they're doing, how they work, and why. Um, the issues of educating folks about their fund, both the entrepreneurs who will receive innovative non-traditional capital and the investors who obviously have to capitalize these funds um, and understand the sort of mission of the fund to provide capital in a non-traditional way. Uh, and then of course the outcomes, I mean the, the why we're all here, what happens when you run a fund like this and when you make these sorts of investments or capital infusions into businesses. So. Um, Without further ado, um, and I wanted to say, first of all, um, one more thing in terms of like level setting here. We want to commit to using sort of like lay people's English. And so if there are terms that we use that are uh, not intuitive, please ask us to clarify. This world is full of unnecessarily jargony uh, language, and we, we aim to be really sort of uh, straightforward with how we describe this stuff. Um, and, and like Charnay said with our introduction, um, please bring your energy. Uh, we'd love to see a room full of uh, curious faces. So if there's thoughts you have, make sure you write them down. Uh, we'd love to address them in the Q&A section. So with that, um, I'd love to talk a little bit more about the fund design story with each of you. And so maybe could you start, and we can just go down the line in this order like before. Um, could you start with the problem of unmet capital needs and maybe an example of an entrepreneur that you um, have worked with with your fund and how your sort of non-traditional capital product helped solve a problem for him or her? Sure. So at Capitalize, I mentioned we invest in technology companies. So these are, you know, technologies and tools that ultimately can plug into a consumer brand. So they're in this like world of commerce, world of commerce enablement. But then on the other side of the table, we're investing in consumer brands or CPG companies. And so that really is where we've seen an interesting need for, um, you know, more creative funding structures like this revenue-based investment vehicle. And so um, what we've seen is that there are amazing, diverse founders on both sides of the table. And I think over the last few years, a lot of these numbers have come to light around, you know, the percentage of black founders or Latino founders that get investment. Um, and so we are focused in that area on the tech side. But I think what we also have seen is that there are really talented founders that are just not in technology based businesses. And so what did they do? And so, um, you know, during the time that I was developing the thesis around Capitalize, I was like, you know, when I see these you know, diverse founders, these amazing founders that aren't developing tech companies, like what do they do? Where do they find capital? Because banks typically aren't reaching down below a company that's doing a million in revenue annually. They're not investing or, you know, funding companies that are not profitable yet. And so, like, there's not an opportunity for them to access bank debt. But then also a lot of VC funds don't like investing in things that aren't tech. And so there's a world of non-technical founders that have very few options. And so we wanted to incorporate that into our strategy for one reason being that we wanted to support these types of founders. And so, for example, um, we have invested in a coffee company. So we're based in Chicago. We love to invest locally, although we invest across the country. Um, but this coffee company, it's called Creepy Coffee. They were our first revenue-based investment. And um, they had bootstrapped their way to doing about a million in revenue, but they had still not accessed bank debt. Um, and so we were able to come in. Uh, we invested over two investments. We invested 100K total. Um, and then at that point, we give those companies a six-month grace period, and then they start making payments back to the fund as a percentage of revenue. And so this percentage for them was like less than, I want to say, two, maybe a little over 2% um, of revenue on a monthly basis. So it's something that is bite-sized, um, and they are going to be making those payments back to us as a fund until they have returned us two and a half times our investment. And so that's kind of how we structure it. But what we've seen is that this coffee company has then been able to attract other types of capital with the opportunity that we gave them to increase their revenue kind of in the short term. Um, and so we've brought in partners of ours from the family offices that have invested in our fund to double down and co-invest with us. And that has been a really interesting opportunity. So I think we were kind of that like in-between um, 
financing vehicle that allowed them to then get to a point where they were attractive to another larger funder who invested a lot more capital than we did. <laughs> in, in our case, um, I guess maybe one question for the audience. Uh, can you r raise your hand if anyone here is from Latin America or working in Latin America? Okay, great. We have, we have a few. Um, I think, and, I'm, and it's great to, to hear Tessa first, because I, I think there's some interesting similarities and differences between the challenges that, that, that we saw in Latin America and uh, in, in designing factual capital and what Tessa was describing. So some of the similarities, um, there are geographic uh, disparities and biases. Uh, in the US might be that San Francisco, Boston, New York uh, get almost all the venture capital in Latin America, um, where which is a region of 28 countries. Uh, Two countries get 60 percent, uh, receive 60 percent of venture capital funding, and five countries receive 90 percent. Um, two two biggest economies in Latin America being Brazil and Mexico, and so uh, you have all the other the countries. We're focused on the Andean region, which has some of the smaller, uh, forgotten countries. Uh, so there's there's biases there, uh, and then also the the, the, the similarity. Uh, the diverse founders have trouble accessing uh, funding. Diverse or unrepresented founders in Latin America, exactly what that means might look a little bit different than the U.S., but the principle is the same. Uh, female founders receive a very small percentage uh, of, of funding. Indigenous founders receive a very small percentage of funding. Uh, and so there's similar gaps in, in access to VC from that perspective. And then, of course, the type of business. As, as Tessa was describing, not all businesses uh, can or want to uh, access VC. A couple of uh, important differences in Latin America. Um, the VC market is much smaller uh, and not as deep. Um, the US is 25% of global GDP and receives 50% uh, of global venture capital funding. Latin America is 1%, uh, excuse me, 6% of global GDP and re receives 1% uh, of global venture capital funding, so significantly smaller uh, as a percentage of GDP, and it's much harder for even a founder who might check the traditional boxes to, to, to raise venture capital. Uh, another important difference um, is the banking system. Uh, it's a challenge for founders in Latin America to access the banking system, but even more, the banking system is even more conservative and, and less flexible than it, than it might be in the US. Uh, and com companies can have millions of dollars in revenue and still not be able to take a, out a bank loan uh, without uh, putting a, a guarantee, putting down their, their grandmother's house as a guarantee uh, or um, having to go to other more ex extreme uh, measures. So um, really those are the inputs that, uh, that led us to create Impacto Capital, understanding the difficulty in access to VC on one side, the difficulty in accessing uh, bank financing on the other side, uh, and understanding that we needed to create a mezzanine instrument, uh, in our case, revenue-based revenue -based loans, uh, that, can, that can fill that gap and that can work for uh, founders who might not have uh, access to um, other types of capital. Uh, our investment structure works actually exactly exactly the same as, as what Tessa just described. Um, and uh, I guess maybe one other point kind of in our per the journey of, of, of fund design. So Impacto Capital um, as a fund uh, is a spin-off uh, of Impacto, which is uh, an ecosystem builder that's been operating uh, for almost 10 years as one of the main players in impact investing in, in Latin America, um, accelerating over 300 uh, entrepreneurs uh, impact startups from from all over uh, the the region. Um, also hosting impact investing events and really kind of seeing we saw where the gaps were uh, in the access to capital through that work, and that's what us what what led us to to create the fund and in the end to go with this uh, alternative uh, investment instrument and revenue based financing specifically. Yeah, sure. Uh, d example of a deal. Um, uh, there's a proving proving company that we invested in uh, called called Elsa. Um, Marlene is here, uh, if, if anyone gets a chance to meet her, uh, she's amazing. Uh, Elsa is, uh, provides a technology platform that allows companies to prevent sexual harassment in the workplace, uh, and companies that, uh, that use their tool see a 60% reduction in, um, in sexual harassment uh, in, their, in their organizations, uh, and they have uh, great, great traction, are, are scaling quickly, and really uh, addressing something that's uh, a huge problem, not only in Latin America, but, but globally. Uh, and, and very impactful in what they're doing. Uh, yeah, so I think the journey for um, Dinsham was a winding path, uh, but it's, it really roots back to the policies that were uh, established to, to generate wealth for select groups and excluding other groups, in this case, black Americans. Um, so you think of things like the GI Bill, 
um, that allows for folks to actually build wealth. Uh, we were, uh, you know, my ancestors were excluded from those opportunities um, and other asset building opportunities. Um, so that's really the root of all of this. Um, and Densham really, I wouldn't have said this at the beginning of starting uh, Densham, um, but we really strive to kind of be the rich auntie and uncle that we all deserve, um, that we would have uh, if it wasn't for those exclusionary practices. Um, yeah, and, and the whole approach, we use revenue-based financing as well. Um, and the reason for that is because I saw companies like Lighter Capital doing this for SaaS business, businesses, um, and I just figured we deserve that as well. We deserve flexibility um, for seasonality of business, of, of owning a business, um, and yeah, just the opportunity to really focus on growth as opposed to paying back debt. Uh, so that's really what went into creating the the approach that we have. Um, uh, my favorite example is our very first loan, uh, which is Jacob Willard Home. is a vintage furniture store. Uh, he refer he he is like a fanatic of vintage furniture. Um, you would have never guessed it, but he like he'll go in if he sees a piece of furniture, he'll be like, oh, I know what year that was made, who made it, uh, the the economy at that time. He'll he'll go all the way in. Um, but he was he was in business for five years. Um, was actually thinking of closing just because he was having a really hard time. His showroom was actually more of like a warehouse. Um, and he wanted to use our that initial loan to kind of clean it up and make it more of an actual showroom where people can actually test the furniture out. Um, and so he, he was at this crossroad of either clo closing down his business and starting something else or going uh, back to, you know, to work for another company um, or taking out this loan. Um, let me backtrack a little. He's actually, he actually had experience uh, as a mortgage lender and he had never applied for a business loan because he knew that on paper he would not he would be looked at as a risky loan. So he didn't even try to apply for a loan. And that's actually true for a lot of black owned businesses. Um, so he got to know each other. Um, you know, he learned about what we were trying to build with Densham. Um, and he felt comfortable enough to take out a loan from us. Um, and yeah, since then he's actually had some of his best years. Uh, especially during the pandemic. A lot of people like uh, getting, getting new furniture during the pandemic, um, and he had it all. Um, but yeah. That's great. Those, those uh, case studies or examples, I think, really like bring home these concepts. And so maybe let's double click on the entrepreneurs for a minute in particular. You all have come to the conclusion, based on your observations, that you have, there's a solution for a market need in each of your communities. There's entrepreneurs with capital needs that are not currently being met by their local capital markets, and you have an idea for a solution that doesn't take the shape of a traditional debt product or nor a traditional equity investment, as some would say, and it's, it's kind of nuanced, it's unique, and you see the way in that it, it works and creates these kind of like shared mutual incentives with entrepreneurs. It models out as a portfolio over the course of the lifetime of your fund, which is good for you all as a business, but how do you get the entrepreneur to understand this novel capital product? And what's the experience of that like? It's costly, I imagine, in the sort of time and energy that you spend with entrepreneurs. Or maybe it's not. But I'm curious, what's your experience like helping entrepreneurs understand something that is otherwise, you know, uh, not market standard for the way they capitalize their businesses? We can go, we can go inverse orientation this time, yeah. I mean, I'm gonna say this as many times as I can. It comes down to relationships. Um, like with uh, Carl, the first loan, uh, we got to know each other for probably like five months before we moved forward with any actual loan conversation. Um, I was a client, I bought something of his that I probably didn't actually use. Um, but just to show him that I'm investing in his business um, and I'm coming, I'm not just coming to try to sell a loan to him. Um, and I think like for some of our other partner or other clients, uh, it just takes a really long time for them to trust any kind of lender in the first place. Um, it helps a little bit that I'm from the community and that I am also an entrepreneur, um, so we can connect on that level, but actually just being really clear, like, look, our loan is 1.1 X return on a $10,000 loan. It's a $1,000 fee. And then we spread that out evenly over the 36 months. Um, so they're actually only paying for the fee, uh, for the time that they're holding the loan. Um, and so I try to be as clear as possible in the early days when it was just me uh, with, our, with our potential borrowers that this is really a low cost, accessible loan that's meant to help you grow. Um, and we keep our, all of our documents as clear as possible. Um, and even then, they might not read the whole thing, right? Like, not, I don't know, another show of hands question. How many of y'all, how many of y'all own a home? 
How many of y'all read and understood everything in your signing documents? There we go. Hey, I need to hang out with you <laughs> because that was. Um, but we try to make it as simple as possible and and not 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 um, not dumb it down, but just say like, look, these this is how this works. Uh, if you have any questions, let us know. And then even after the loan is already out there, like let's continue to learn about it, right? Because it's, it's not going to be clear on the on the first day. In our case, um, our, our team, our fund's been operating for a little under a year. Our team's talked to somewhere between 400 and 500 startups, uh, or founders, I should say. Um, I don't, we don't keep this, track this metric, it would be interesting, but I'm guessing probably less than 10 had heard of revenue-based financing before the conversation with us. Um, and so it, it's, a, it's a completely different experience as a, as a revenue-based financing fund talking with a founder because you have to allocate 15 minutes of the meeting uh, to explaining how your fund works and and why it's interesting, um, I mean, it, it, those of us who are in this world, I think we we sort of accept that uh, w this requires more effort and more time um, and more passion than than VC uh, VC investing because of the time that you need to spend with with entrepreneurs um, and also with with LPs, which I think we'll talk about later. So. Um, I think we're, we're always very honest. Uh, Revenue-based financing is not the best solution for every business. Um, and uh, I think uh, you have to have an honest conversation with, with entrepreneurs, uh, explain how the instrument works, what the advantages are, um, and say, in your case, I don't think you should take, I don't think you should continue in the investment process with us because this isn't the right uh, financial solution for you. Um, there's very few, I talked a little bit about the, the restrictiveness of the banking system in Latin America, there's very few debt funds, um, so there's very few access to debt uh, period for um, early stage entrepreneurs, um, or even, even later stage entrepreneurs, so understanding, having the conversation with the entrepreneur of why is, should you look at debt, I and mean, there's this culture, I think this is just globally, there's this culture of equity, culture of the announcing the valuation of the of, of the startup and how much money was raised uh, and and no no startup ever announces uh, I read you know we reached five million dollars in in revenue today uh, it's it's all about the, the the financing that's raised and it's all about equity rounds and so having that honest conversation with an entrepreneur and saying debt exists and you as as a as a founder you can raise debt uh, and not only that there's this interesting you know mezzanine debt uh, flexible capital. Uh, that we're offering, and, and and this is why it's interesting. So uh, it takes it requires a lot of education. Um, I'm hopeful we're in the earliest parts of our journey, but I'm hopeful that it's also a, a virtuous uh, cycle where uh, our portfolio companies talk to other entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs in general try to start to hear more uh, about uh, alternative financing uh, instruments, uh, and also you know there need to be a lot more funds doing uh, doing what doing what we're doing, and and, and hopefully over the the coming years there are a lot more. Uh, Latin American funds uh, doing that, and it becomes a normal thing for entrepreneurs to, for the first step of a fundraising process, to be what type of capital should I raise? Not, I need money, I'm going to raise venture capital. Yeah, my experience is actually very similar to yours, Justin. Um, so I have had conversations, so I'll just say a lot of founders step into the f fundraising world and they're like, I need VC. And I think it's not talked about enough that VC is not the sil silver bullet for all companies. And so, and we market ourselves as a VC fund. Like we are 90% a traditional VC fund with this very interesting feature. And that's how I kind of describe it to LPs, which we'll get to. Um, but I think, so we've had, we have founders come to us thinking we're a traditional VC fund um, and, we get into the first conversation and I'm like immediately telling them, you know, we invest in, in consumer brands a little bit differently and this is how we do it. And so we spend part of the meeting talking about that and I like to be very upfront about it. And so we've had experiences where founders take that very well, but then we've also had experiences where founders like really don't take that well. And, and so um, I, I do share with them that, you know, this is a more expensive, um, uh, offer than a traditional commercial loan. Like it's just, it's a more expensive vehicle for you, but it also has these benefits that um, debt doesn't have and that equity doesn't have. And so I spend time talking about 
how, you know, debt is this consistent, you know, payment on a monthly basis that has very little flexibility, but at, at the same time, it doesn't take ownership in your company versus equity that is long-term, you know, you don't have to pay anything back, but it's taking a large portion of your company from you potentially. And so we're right here in the middle where we're offering you this growth-oriented type of funding vehicle. We're aligning ourselves with your growth um, and at the same time offering you the opportunity to buy back your equity over time. And so for a lot of founders, like after having some, you know, parts of that conversation, they, they, want to learn more and they're more interested in it. And so we've had co conversations all across that spectrum. Um, but I think what we've learned is that uh, through our process, it makes the most sense to put something in front of them as soon as possible. So we've made the mistake of going through like an entire diligence process and like explaining it to them, but um, getting to the end of it and getting to like a term sheet stage and they're like, wait, what are all these different terms? Like what's going on here? And so we actually, after a first conversation, we say, you know, we wanna make sure this is the right fit for both of us. And so we're gonna ask for your financials and in return, we're gonna send you an example of a term sheet that resembles something like what this deal is gonna look like um, so that you can look at it, you can talk to your advisors about it, you can talk to your team about it, you can show it to anybody. Um, but ultimately that helps us align in conversation two on whether this makes sense to them, whether it makes sense for us. And then from there, our diligence process really is just like us confirming those numbers that we sent them in that early term sheet. And so that's how we've kind of shifted our entire process and kind of flipped it on its head to make sure that we're being extremely transparent with founders and we're kind of helping them learn as we go. As I'm listening to you all talk about the time and energy you spend investing with entrepreneurs, educating them, I'm struck by how the future of innovative fund managers will all benefit from the hard work that you're doing now that y your funds may not be able to benefit from, but 10, 20 years from now, when these things are market standard, you will have paved the way with the hundreds of conversations you have with entrepreneurs who now are more familiar, but weren't a fit maybe at, at this point. So uh, you'll be owed a debt of gratitude. Maybe if this is recorded, somebody 10, 20 years from now will watch it back and uh, give you guys your, your flowers. Um, so we, we mentioned this or alluded to this several times. There's the complex issues of explaining and educating entrepreneurs on these non-traditional capital products. But ultimately, it sounds like when it's a fit, it's understood by both parties. And entrepreneurs who need capital understand that this capital is well suited for their business when, when it's clear that that's the case for both parties. In all of your instances, the RBF structure, this revenue-based financing structure, has unique components which sort of align your interest with theirs in ways that other investors may not. They're not just one of a spray and pray strategy in a venture capital portfolio. They're also not just a fixed interest term loan, which otherwise you know repays on the same schedule regardless of your interventions post deal. And so there are all these sort of like ways that you are incented. So I can see how entrepreneurs come to eventually understand it. The other issue then is the upstream education, which is for the investors that would capitalize your funds or your strategies. So I wonder, how has it been for you all and how do you educate, how do you communicate your non-traditional fund structure to the institutions that, that capitalize or would capitalize your funds? Maybe Justin, you wanna go first? Sure, I, I, I don't know which is harder, educating entrepreneurs or educating LPs, uh, but they're both difficult. Um, I guess our journey, um, we, we started fundraising for Impact Capital uh, locally in Ecuador, uh, talking with, um, with Ecuadorian families uh, and, and individuals. And um, I don't think we could have chosen a harder place to start because uh, we were talking to, to a group of people um, who had, didn't know what impact investing was, had never invested in a closed-end fund, uh, had never invested in a startup or in a fund that investments had never didn't understand that world uh, and then adding on top of that this this innovative uh, financing model is revenue based financing um, so the educational process was um, was was difficult um, and and, to, and takes time and, and, and building relationships um, we're by our nature we're ecosystem builders and so building up the LP ecosystem uh, is, is something that we're, we're proud of and hopefully those LPs invest in other funds and, and, and not just in ours, and, and we can have more uh, local capital from Latin America, from 
uh, from the region, investing in entrepreneurs in the region, when a, a lot of families with wealth uh, in Latin America have most of that wealth in uh, out, outside of the region and their, and their home countries. Um, so that re really, the conversations there um, touched you know, the model and, and, and what we were doing, um, but it were so many new things to, to that group of LPs uh, that it was, it was part of a larger conversation. Um, the, the other kind of ha half of the capital we, we've raised in the fund uh, comes from more traditional U US investors, uh, individuals, families, uh, and, and foundations in the US, and um, their um, similar uh, more familiarity with all the other aspects I mentioned, but the, but the revenue-based financing um, world is quite small, and 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 most people uh, don't necessarily understand it. So a, a lot of education on that front. I mean, the risk return profile of a mezzanine debt investment, like revenue based financing, is different than the risk return pr profile of, of venture capital, and that's true at the fund level, and it's true at the LP level. Uh, so a, a venture capital fund will go into an LP's uh, office and and have a chart showing the top. Decile venture capital funds have a 30 to 35 percent IRR, and uh, and that sounds great. Um, if you look at the reality, the, the median venture capital fund has very mediocre returns. Um, re investing in a mezzanine debt fund has different is not a, has different returns, and you can't even pretend that you're going to have those kinds of returns. Uh, so understand a lot of LPs think, at least the LPs that we talk to, think only in return uh, in in, ter in terms of return and don't think about risk. Uh, and the debt investment has a different different risk profile than, than an equity investment. Um, so uh, those are some kind of some of the the, the questions that we got and, and, and the conversations uh, we had. There's a very small group of LPs that are very passionate about uh, alternative financing and hear revenue based financing and get excited. Um, if anyone else in, in this room is is down the same path, uh, look for those LPs. They're they're amazing, uh, but but they're few and far between. Hopefully, in the future, there'll be more. So with Capitalize, we have a pretty diverse group of LPs in our fund, um, but it didn't start that way. And so when I decided to go about this journey, I spun out of another VC fund and I went out to raise and my network looked very different from a lot of the other LPs and funds um, historically. And so I was raising from people who are women, who are people of color, who are first time LPs. And when I went out to have that conversation, you know, hey, I'm starting a VC fund, do you want to invest? It was like, okay, well, what is your minimum commitment? Our minimum commitment is 50K. Um, okay, well, that's doable for me, but when do I get my money back? <laughs> and that was kind of the conversation I had multiple times over. Um, and so I realized very quickly that Re returns or like liquidity was important to this demographic of LP and that those were the LPs that I had access to in those early days. And so um, we were able to pitch our fund in a way that allowed us to say, you know, to these individual LPs, these high net worth individuals that we could ultimately see some returns from the fund come back to us in years five to 10. And so that was really exciting to them. And so we started out raising from strictly high net worth individuals. And that was our first probably two or three closes. And then we were continuing to kind of figure out the pitch as it related to larger institutional investors. And if anybody in this room is a larger institutional investor, you know that you don't really care about early returns. Um, what you care about is maximizing the capital and the return of the fund. And like you were saying, like they want to see, you know, 30% IRRs and 3x plus um, cash on cash returns. And so for those investors, we had to figure out how to tell the story in a different way. Um, and so we were able to kind of create a structure um, that allowed us to then recycle those early returns for a subset of our LPs. And so that's ultimately what we're doing and what's worked for us in having those conversations is to say, well, look, we're getting these early returns, but we're recycling them into the fund, and that's enabling us to actually cover off on a lot of the costs of the fund that you know come out in the form of management fees or fund expenses. And so we are we have yet to see like obviously the results of that, but I think the LPs that we're talking to either understand it or they're like, look, this is like a little complicated, but we trust you. Like we are open to this 
concept and we want to see how that works. And these are institutional investors like corporates or fund of fund LPs. Um, we have some family offices as well, but like um, we're talking to a foundation now. And so it's like there's opportunities out there, but it's definitely like you have to learn how to tell the story in a way that resonates with them in a way that actually makes like financial sense to them. Because if you just go out there and tell them you're changing everything that's existed for centuries, like they're going to be like, what? Like, no, thank you. <laughs> so that's kind of been our journey and how we've been able to um, circumnavigate it. Uh, yeah, I think for Densham, uh, it's less about educating because we're still learning ourselves. Uh, one of my favorite um, phrases that I, I kind of live by is make the road by walking. Um, so instead of like trying to educate potential investors, it's more about learning together um, and, and building relationships. I'll keep going back to that. Uh, we have probably a handful of investors that have really supported us over the last five years. Um, and I think from there, you know, the idea is that they will be able to explain their journey with Densham and then we can kind of grow in a methodical pace like that. Um, and I feel so blessed to have the, the time, space, and resources to be able to grow that way um, because that's exactly what we're trying to afford for our, our clients as well. Um, so yeah, again, I think it's, and, and I, I was a teacher, uh, so education, I take it very seriously. And actually that phrase I got from Paolo Freire, if anyone knows who that is. Anyone know who Paolo Freire is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, has, he has a book called Make the Road by Walk and I recommend it. Um, but yeah, education is, is very important to me, but I think in this case, it's about learning together. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's really good. Thanks, Dion. So in terms of communication with those folks that you all just mentioned, the investors, the would-be investors, a lot of them probably ask about the outcomes from your innovative fund models or the capital products that you're providing. Um, I know you're all very early in your efforts and kind of like early days, but I'm curious, how do you quantify both the impact and the pure financial metrics that you keep track of for your funds or for your strategies? Um, what does success look like for you and how do you plan on sort of communicating the inevitable uh, information that you collect to your LPs, to the investors? to the community at large to help folks understand whether this is something worth doing themselves. Um, it's a clearly a nascent community in general, and you're some of the front runners doing this with like a few years experience under your belts respectively. Uh, but curious how you're all thinking about the issue of sort of like impact measurement, quantifying outcomes, and what are the, what are the kind of variables that for you move the needle? For us, I think the ultimate display and the way that this will ultimately catch on is through the founders, through founder stories and successes. And so I think you mentioned earlier um, kind of something along those lines, but um, we are really trying to ultimately amplify our founders and have them share it with their founder communities to, ult to ultimately get more founders kind of thinking about this instead of just like going straight to VC. Um, I think from the LP perspective, I mean, we are tracking the number of companies that we're investing in like this. So we've done two so far. We have a pipeline of like 10 that we're kind of in conversations with at, at this time. And so just showing them that like this market exists, I think is an interesting metric for them to understand because oftentimes they're like, what are you talking about? Like, this isn't a problem. And, and so I think by showing them that there are founders that are open to this um, is helpful for them. And then we are also, I think, seeing that one, we're, we're seeing returns come back. So like on that $100,000 investment I mentioned in the coffee company, um, it's been almost two years since our initial investment and we've already seen over 50K come back. So as soon as we do our final close, we will be paying that out to a portion of our LPs and we'll be recycling it to the other portion of our LPs. And so they'll be experiencing this like real time with us and we're tracking that on a quarterly basis so that they can keep up with us on that side of the table. Um, but I think something that we are seeing that's really interesting is that we're also co-investing with our LPs on some of these deals. And that I think is 
a pretty interesting piece of this is like a lot of, and, and these co-investors are our family office LPs. And so what I'm seeing is that for these CPG companies, they're oftentimes hiring more in their local communities, um, which is impact. And that's the impact that a lot of family offices that are locally, um, you know, investing want to see. And so there's this opportunity for deeper impact in communities, um, which we're tracking by thinking about hiring local talent um, and, and creating jobs, but also seeing that increase in investment downstream um, as we're bringing on co-investors alongside of us. For us on, on the financial side, um, I guess the one thing I would say, I don't know if we have any LPs in the, in the audience, but um, uh, the, in the VC world, funds often talk about, uh, talk about the multiple on the fund, um, talk about a three times or a four times fund as a, as a good outcome. Uh, the, I think, um, understanding the LPs, understanding that, uh, kind of as Tessa was saying, the, the, the return on that is coming after, uh, five, seven to 10 years. Uh, I think I saw someone in the average VC fund now is, is, is 12 years and some up to 15 years. Um, so sometimes a, a multiple on capital for the fund that sounds attractive actually isn't that attractive in IRR terms um, in, in, the v, in the VC world. Uh, and I think uh, that's, we talk a lot about, uh, really talk, focus on IRR, um, because I think that's the most relevant metric for, for a revenue-based financing fund uh, and a way to, way to differentiate. Uh, on, the, on the impact side, um, so we're, we're an impact investing fund, so that's a key part of what we do. We're only investing in uh, companies that, are, that have a, a deep social impact uh, among vulnerable communities, uh, or uh, a strong environmental impact. Um, and we are uh, working with those companies to develop, develop impact metrics uh, and define impact metrics in our loan documents. Uh, we, we include those impact metrics and require them to report quarterly uh, their progress on those metrics. And we, we report uh, those to our, to our LPs, both at a company level and a portfolio level. Uh, and our, are, our LPs are really motivated uh, by the impact that's being generated by the fund, and they, they like the fact that we're we're an impact investing fund. Um, so that's a key part of what we're do, we, we do um, and and how we report uh, to our LPs and um, and also talk about externally uh, to the general public the the impact that we're generating through the companies uh, that we invest in and, and their beneficiaries. Uh, yeah, I think for us um, at Fincham, we are like really checking in on our clients. Um, so, I mean, the reporting to our, our, our funders um, is important, but more importantly is the well-being of our clients. And then from there, we can say, you know, the reasons why our borrowers came to Dencham. Um, we can look at the traditional things like how many jobs were created or how the revenue increased. But really, at the end of the day, it's how is your quality of life as a borrower because of this product that we provided for you? Um, yeah, so it's, the priority is, uh, for at Dentium, the priority really is our borrowers, and I think our, our investors, our, our values align with that, and they understand that. Um, so we don't, we don't compromise uh, our, vi our mission and vision for the impact reporting. Um, with that said, you know, in order to reach higher levels, we have to make sure that we are you know, following best practices. Um, but still at the core, it's always the well-being of our client. So that's what it is. That's great. Thank you all. Um, I want to make sure we have a lot of time for Q&A. I hope that everybody who has questions has gotten access to a card. This is a good, actually, moment to check. Uh, raise your hand if you have a question for these panelists. Proudly. Got to see them. Love it. Thank you so much. So proud. Um, okay, great. If you've got a question, have you been able to write it down? Same hands? Yeah? No? Okay. Well, if you have a question, let's make sure you can write it down. Um, would love to get those from you all. I want to give our panelists one chance to have kind of a final word on, on the subject. Um, if each of you, I didn't prep you for this, so shooting from the hip here. If each of you have a common misconception or something you'd like to clarify or, or one thing you'd like folks to understand about the innovative capital product that you provide or the sort of nature of non-traditional capital for entrepreneurs in general. If there's anything you can think of that you, you wish you could clarify or that a room full of folks who've signed up to hear about this, you wish they understood, is there anything that strikes you? Dion, maybe first? Sure, yeah, I guess I would just say, um, while there is a, a greater movement uh, 
for the whole BIPOC community. Each member of BIPOC has unique needs um, that need to be addressed. Um, so we are very intentional that our costs are low um, and accessible for black entrepreneurs. And this is, uh, this is because we have unique needs in each community, right? Black, indigenous, and all POC. So I think it, it's good to have the collective and we need to make sure that we are addressing the needs of each one of those. Um, and then, yeah, we're intentionally keeping our costs low. So 1.1x is very, very low. A lot of people look at me like I'm, I'm losing it. Um, but it's by design. Uh, we're a social purpose corporation and we're gonna continue to do that. We'll never pass our costs on to our clients. I think whether you're an entrepreneur, uh, an investor, uh, a funder, um, let's let's kill the cult of VC. Uh, nothing nothing against VC. I know Tessa does, does a VC model as well. The first question any entrepreneur or investor should ask is is what's the right type of capital for this company uh, at this moment and we're skipping that and for for some percentage of the company the answer is vc and and and, and i think vc is an, an amazing innovation and an important part of of, of the ecosystem uh, but we're skipping that question and i think the answer to that question for uh for a lot of uh entrepreneurs is uh alternative financing uh, sources, whether that be, you know, revenue based financing is just one, we're all revenue based financing investors here, but that's just one type uh, of alternative uh, capital structure. Uh, we need more innovation. Um, there's uh, more and more investors that are innovating and, and we need to also make sure that entrepreneurs uh, know, know about this, this and, and that everyone in this room, whatever your role can be evangelists uh, for alternative capital structures. I think mine is something I touched on a little bit earlier today, but um, be, just because we're doing some revenue-based financing doesn't mean we are discretionary or like not going to be achieving or going after the you know venture scale returns ultimately at the end of the day because there are interesting things you can do behind the scenes in order to recycle capital in ways that still allow you to achieve that. Awesome, thank you all. Got some great questions here from the audience. Looks like we've got some more being sourced. Uh, if I don't understand your question completely, I'll just ask you to clarify it and I uh, hope I don't call you out by doing that. You Feel free to ignore it if I uh, botch it and you don't wanna claim it. Um, so I'm just gonna read these on the fly. How is venture capital and revenue-based investing for small, minority, and underserved not the same thing as predatory lending at a 2x repayment on RBI and giving up ownership percentage for VC? Does the flexibility justify the means? Mm. Want me to read it again? Yeah. yeah. Um, how is venture capital and revenue-based investing for a small, minority, underserved I imagine that means for a small minority and underserved business business owner, not the same thing as predatory lending at a 2x repayment on revenue-based investing and giving up ownership percentage for VC. I think an important clarification here is that between the three panelists on this stage, they are aiming to serve a wide variety of entrepreneurs. And so while 2x sounds like a very expensive rate, for an entrepreneur to pay for borrowing money, especially when compared to like bank rates, for instance. Dion serves clients in the Seattle area with RBF at a 1.1 rate, very competitive, and is a much more flexible lender than any credit provider in the region would be willing to be. Dion's organization, Dentium, provides capital without any of the formal underwriting rigmarole that even CDFIs in the region are typically providing. And so that serves small business borrowers that may be going after credit. Now, for instance, some of the borrowers that would come to a Tessa or come to a Justin at their firms, these folks would otherwise be seeking the sorts of high risk growth capital that if they were successful in achieving venture capital money for their business would cost them exorbitantly more than 2x, 20x, 200x for the cost of capital in terms of what they give up and ownership of their business. And so I think it's all relative in the sense of what are the, in what competitive landscape is each of these options playing. I think it's a great point. 2x is not a cheap rate for money, but it is certainly much cheaper than a venture capitalist buying 30% of your business, especially if you become completely whole and ownership of your business again after the, the money is repaid to the investor. So we wouldn't give 
we wouldn't go into business with a company that couldn't handle it. So we're, we're talking to companies and our, our diligence process really is, is like, okay, what are your margins? Like, what are your growth rates? How have you grown over the past two years and what are your projections for the future? Um, and so we have to see companies that are high growth enough to handle this type of capital. And if it's not the case, then like we were saying earlier, like there are times where we have to say like, this isn't going to work. It's not in your best interest. Um, and then I think also what we've seen are like things like Shopify capital and, and, and tools like that, that are asking founders to pay back in the next six months or the next eight months. And so I think it also depends on the time frame of that payback of two X or in our case, two and a half X. Um, we are looking over a much longer time, time span of, you know, five plus years. And so when you take that into account, I think the rates become a little bit more palatable rather than like, a, you know, a lender in the South that might be trying to take advantage of founders and, you know, ask them for 2x in the span of next month or whatever it is. So I, I, I think there is um, just, yeah, some discrepancy on the type of company that this works for and then also the time span that we're asking for that repayment. Thanks, that's a great question. Uh, I have a real um, a technical question for the three of you. How do you account for these investments on your balance sheet? And do you support your investees or recipients of the capital so that they can understand how to account for them on their balance sheets? I imagine you all have separate answers for this. Maybe you could quickly go down the line. For instance, I imagine this question is alluding to, are you holding these assets or these liabilities as debt or equity on your balance sheets? How do you encourage entrepreneurs to account for RBF? I'm not an accountant. Important clarification. <laughs> um, but yeah, so they, these are loans on our on our balance sheet. Um, we ha That's a really good point. I never thought about how to coach our clients, but that's not really our role. Um, but I, I think in the formative TA that we pro provide, the one-on-one -on -one relationship building and, and support, um, setting up your accounting system is like number one for all of our clients. Um, and so I, instead of us coming in, because we, we aren't taking equity and we, we, we aren't here, here to tell them what to do, um, but we can do our best to connect them with the resources they need to actually put their business on more of a system, especially with accounting. Um, so that's, that's, that's our approach. Uh, we, our, ours are, are revenue-based loans, uh, so they're loans uh, on, on, on the balance sheet of the fund, and they're, they're loans for the entrepreneurs, and, and really the accounting is, uh, is, is the same as it would be for, for any other loan. And ours is basically a convertible note, um, so we have the option to convert at times, um, so, and, and so we hold it as convertible debt, and then they also do hold it as convertible debt. Yeah, that makes sense. From what we've seen across the industry, many folks encourage entrepreneurs or at least may suggest with the caveat that they are not accountants themselves, that entrepreneurs consider the principal repayment and the anything above the principal repayment, for instance, the amount up to that 1.1 cap that the entrepreneurs receive from Dentium to be effectively the interest expense on this. And it's, it's you know, they account for it as such uh, spread out over the term of the loan. This also means that RBF investors are typically receiving uh, income that's qualified as um, earned income rather than capital gains, which affects the fund structure. Um, so certainly a lot of uh, nuance and details there to be explored further. And I'm sure these folks can at least point you in the direction of their accountants for specific responses. This is not a, this is not a uh, open and shut uh, sort of issue though, and there's a lot of discrepancies even today in how folks tend to think about the accounting for RBF in particular. So it's a great question. Um, th there's a secondary question on this one, which maybe we can just give a nod to, which is given the size of the investments, it sounds like valuations would be incredibly costly. So I assume you avoid valuations with your RBF portfolio? We, um, we don't value, but we do have convertible, we have convertible notes basically. So we put a valuation cap on the companies that we invest in. Um, to kind of be able to calculate our ownership at investment. And then, as I mentioned, over time, they're buying that ownership back. Um, and so typically, I mean, we're looking at CPG companies, so consumer-based companies, um, and we're usually valuing them somewhere around like five, maybe sometimes 10 times revenue, depending on the industry. 
in, in our case, uh, they're, they're, our revenue-based loans are pure loans, uh, and we're not valuing the company. I think it, it's a good question because it's, uh, I didn't mention it. None of, none of us mentioned it, I think, but one of the advantages for um, of, of revenue-based financing uh, versus uh, in, in investing in equity is that a lot of the conversation with VCs comes around to the valuation of the company, and, uh, and, and we don't have to touch that point with the, with the uh, entrepreneurs that we invest in. This is a, a question in a similar vein, which is uh, this person says they've heard that RBFs can discourage future equity investors from participating. Have you experienced anything like this with the entrepreneurs you've supported? Have you heard this, that maybe your RBF could discourage future equity investors? And how do you even think about entrepreneurs taking on equity after you make an RBF investment in, in their business? I, I can, I mean, I can speak to this because we, we recently closed an investment uh, that the company, we, we closed a revenue-based loan. The company has uh, raised capital from four, uh, four venture capital or, or impact venture capital fund, raised equity, I should say, from four venture capital uh, and, and impact funds. And, uh, and we are very excited to co-invest with these funds. They're very excited to, to have us. Um, I mean, there's different, uh, it's a, it's a, Fair question because there's different logics that different VCs can have. VCs might say, "Well, why are you raising debt? Because every dollar that you go back to that goes to interest expense is a dollar that could be invested in, in into the business, uh, into scaling." Um, but it's non-dilutive capital. I mean, I think that's an important thing to to remember. So it's really in the interest not only of the founders who maintain uh, ownership of their company, but in the interest of the other VCs for. Um, for companies to raise capital without diluting the, the ownership of those VCs. We've seen companies kind of do a blended strategy. So we invest alongside of VCs. We invest alongside of uh, banks. Um, and I think within the types of companies we're investing in, they have a lot of like inventory expenses, uh, team expenses. And I would say the other thing is like marketing is a huge thing that a lot of these companies need to do. And so what we've seen is that our capital is potentially better for like that inventory side of things and then and maybe some team but then venture capital is better for like the marketing side of the table and so um and we've seen that kind of work across the portfolio oh yeah for us i think probably less than 10 percent of our portfolio is like looking for that type of investment um and one example i can think of right now uh, is a i'm gonna try to get this right a telerobotic surgery company um which i haven't um, but <clears throat> they needed a loan to be able to get uh, equipment to be able to, you know, build up their data and, and, and kind of prove that what they're doing will work. Um, so they have their plan and set or a set already for raising after they, you know, gather their data. So this, that's, that was, this was, our, it was an atypical loan for us, um, but they understood our um, mission and they chose to come with us. They could have gone to another uh, lender, but they chose to come to us because of our mission. This, this question uh, has to do with incentives, and I figure maybe I would reiterate on one of the points that we touched on before, which is that all three of these investment fund managers use revenue-based financing in some capacity, like we've talked about. Tessa's fund uses what's, it's this redeemable equity instrument treated like a convertible note, and then Dion's organization, Dentrum, has a much more loan-adjacent product, but all of them have this unique incentive structure which kind of aligns the entrepreneur and the investor in a distinct way that's different than maybe an equity investor or a term lender, for instance. This question says, how does revenue-based financing change the incentives for early exits versus long-termism, new phrase, I like that, compared to equity-based financing, in parentheses? So I wonder if you could talk about sort of like, what are the incentives that RBF termed capital establishes between you and your borrower, or your investee, that you think are an asset or makes you interested in doing this and maybe like could be compared to alternatives like for instance equity investing uh yeah so we incentivize early payback um don't look at me like i'm weird when i say this but uh you don't pay for the fee if if you already paid the principal down so if you pay the 36 month loan off or a ten thousand dollar loan 36 months if you pay it off in 18 months you're only paying five hundred dollars for a ten thousand dollar loan um, and that's so we can get the money back and keep it moving. Um, so yeah, simple as that. One conversation we have with with founders um, who have yet to raise uh, equity capital is um, are really the implications of going down the VC path 
um, which the VC funds need an exit. Uh, in the end, they need to exit their investment, I should say, that, that can sometimes come through secondaries, but usually uh, often they're looking for an, an exit of the company. And, and for an entrepreneur, you know, that means being prepared to, to, to sell your company uh, or, or, or go public if you're, you're able to do that in, often in five to seven years. And so, uh, you know, entrepreneurs who are maybe looking to build a company for the long term, maybe looking to build, you know, a multi-generational company and have that, that vision that lasts decades, that's one of the reasons that VC might not be a good fit. Uh, and revenue-based revenue -based financing, as we're talking about, takes different forms, uh, but revenue-based uh, financing generally has a, a, what's called a structured exit, which means uh, a fancy way of saying you don't need to sell the company uh, for the investor to get their money back. And so it creates that, depending on what the incentives are uh, for the entrepreneur and what they, what they want and what their ambitions are, uh, there can be a really good alignment there. Yeah, basically echoing both of them. Um, we do incentivize early payback because, well, I'll say when we invest, we are aligning ourselves with the company to help them increase revenue. And so, because that's how we get paid. Um, and so we want to do anything possible that we can to help them do that. Um, so when we're looking and talking about portfolio support, we're always open to helping our founders do whatever it is that they need to do. Um, but we do incentivize early payback for the founders. They pay back a smaller multiple if they can pay it back faster. Um, and we're incentivized by early payment as payback as well because that's a higher IRR for our LPs. And so I think we're both aligned there. And then um, in conversations that we're having with founders in a first call, one of my questions always is, is like, where do you want to take this? Like, what is your goal? Do you want to get acquired in the next five years? Or do you want to grow this and potentially like pass this down to your children? And it is there's no right answer. I just want to understand how the founder is thinking about it so that we can figure out, okay, is this a super high growth company that we're going to want to price in a specific way when we do our diligence? Or is this a more long-term play? That and, and either of those are okay. We just want to know what we're getting into and how we can then work with the founder on the terms that we're offering them. Yeah, those are great. Thank you, guys. Uh, this is a question that I think maybe takes a bite at the opposite end of the the sort of like high rates question, which is that it's it, if I'm going to read between the lines on this question, it's like it sounds like you guys are taking a lot of risk with a lot without a lot of downside protections. How do you get comfortable with a fund that seems like it has capped returns? There's only so much you can make with each deal. There's no unlimited upside like a venture capitalist might have but your downside is unlimited, more or less. You, you could lose it all, and there's you know a maximum return you can make on each deal, and therefore on the fund level. How do you sort of get comfortable with that as a fund model, and, and is that something that, you, that keeps you up at night, or that you've thought much about with the fund overall? So we have the ability to uh, structure these deals in innovative ways, and so... We have sometimes offered, you know, this full payback, and then we ask, we have asked for a warrant on the side, really to take part in any upside that um, happens in the future. And then we've also structured this in ways where we've asked the founder to pay back like 90% of our agreement, and then there's still that kind of 10% of the agreement, so not 10% of equity in their company, but 10% of our agreement. Um, that we keep in residual ownership. So this is kind of like the Indie VC model, if any of you guys are familiar with that fund. Um, and so we, as a VC fund, we our LPs would be very upset with us if we weren't able to participate in those upside scenarios. And so we have kind of thought through that and we structure our deals accordingly. We, we have a, a little bit of a different model in the sense that we... we do have our upside cap. Don't don't take uh, equity long term and uh, or or warrants. Um, so I think a lot of the conversation about uh, alternative financing and, and and mezzanine instruments starts the the starting point for the conversation is VC. But there's an entire industry, the private credit industry, 
uh, where you know, the large asset managers are raging, raising billions and, and trillions of dollars for private credit, uh, which is just a, a fancy way of saying making loans to companies. Uh, and and this are often you know senior secured loans that are they're very low risk and and thus the return on those private credit funds is very low. Uh, the, the risk is also very low, and there's an entire industry in LPs who who look for that type of capital. So um, there is a spectrum, of course, of risk and return, and and us as mezzanine investors, we're in between. Uh, our best return isn't going to be as good as the return of the the best VC fund. Uh, but the risk is lower than a VC fund. Um, the question sort of came from that angle of this sounds riskier than um, than a senior secured loan. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, but the return is also higher, and that's part of the conversation. Sometimes, if you calculate the the implied cost of capital or, or IRR for of a revenue based financing for entrepreneurs, the interest rates or the, the the effective cost of capital can sound like high, like big numbers. Sometimes entrepreneurs get scared by that, um, but that's what compensates us as investors for taking that risk. Um, and what I always say to entrepreneurs is the risk for the investor is flexibility for you. And if, if you want more flexibility, so like a six month grace period, like pain based on the performance of the company, uh, you know, uh, not having, not ha uh, needing collateral, the, the price of that is, uh, is, is, is higher, uh, higher rate, higher effective cost, um, because the higher risk for the uh, for the investor, there are am innovative, amazing, innovative models with things like blended finance and philanthropic capital and ways to to reduce the cost to the entrepreneur and reduce the risk to the the investors. Um, but talking kind of in a in a more basic fund structure sense, uh, it, it you know they have to understand where this falls in the risk return spectrum. Hey, I think for us, uh, we just have to do a really good job of what we do. I mean, we really have to go deep and and do the best that we can and the things that are in our control. Things that are in our control will will do that, and the things that are out of our control, we can't we can't control it. Um, and I think if I could do a metaphor, um, you know, we'd love to be a perennial, but if we're an annual, we're going to be one of the most beautiful annuals you've ever seen. 